And then finally, the last hand, this $50,000 pot, involves the same guy that opened the first hand when I had kings who folded queens, who would have flopped top set, this dude from New York. So this guy opens from under the gun. He opens to 300. Like I said, the straddle is pretty much always on. So there's a hundred dollar straddle. So he's opening to three X from under the gun. I'm in the cutoff and I have ace five suited, ace five of hearts. And obviously I can call here, but multiple blinds, anti-game, guys in the blind with any two in their name, you are incentivized to get this heads up. If I three bet here, it's far less likely that the pot's going to go multi-way. Not that, you know, taking ace five suited necessarily is the worst going multi-way. It's a lot better than taking like a direct suited connector when it was going to go multi-way and, you know, can have some reverse implied odds. Although having position is always a strength for those types of hands. So I decided to take the aggressive route and I actually was three betting quite a bit. Like I said, in the video that I'm probably gonna do at the end of the month, I'm gonna go over all of the hands that I three bet and then look at the results of those hands. And, you know, ones that are sort of on the cusp and then look at some hands that I didn't three bet and look at the results of those hands too and see if I would have won by three betting. I think it's a very, very interesting thing because I probably had the highest three bet percentage, I would say, of anyone in the entire table and there were spots that I passed on like, I remember I flat called on the button a couple times with like queen jack of hearts specifically. There was one time when I had king queen off in the small blind and I didn't want to fold it and I called. There was definitely more situations where I could have three bet. So I three bet to a thousand. By the way, so we're, we start with 24.5, 24 and a half on the $100 blind. So like 240 big blinds effective. And um, the guy has me covered by a little bit. He started with... 26 and a half. So he opens to under he opens under the gun to 300. I three bet to a thousand with ace five suit in the cutoff. And what I wanted to have happen happened. It gets folded all the way around to the straddle, though. Guy in the straddle calls this guy Joe, and I didn't see a whole a, a ton with him. Like I know that he was stuck, but he didn't seem to be doing anything that was really, really all that crazy. I am not the best, like I said, at sort of picking out and paying very, very close attention and, and absorbing non-showdown types of things. Like I remember when we played at Stones where they didn't care about people watching the stream or they had the stream on like in the background, I could pick up just so much by just watching the game. Sometimes they had to do this at TCH, like just by watching a couple of rounds, stuff where I knew like, oh, this guy's calling with this hand. He didn't three bet that hand. I knew somebody's skill level by just watching a couple of rounds. Obviously here, they take our phones. I don't have the liberty to do that. I, he just sort of seemed to play tight. And then when I look back at the stats, he played like 26% VPIP. I was like 29. Nick was like 16 so he was sort of, I mean, there was a lot of people that were in like the high 20s to low 30s. Any two Tommy played like 55, Eli played like 38. So there were a couple outliers. He was stuck, but he didn't really seem to be doing anything that was sort of, I would say, crazy or anything that I had really noticed. But again, I'm not the best at noticing these things when I don't see them, you know, necessarily. So he calls in the straddle. I'm like, oh, that's interesting here. So he calls in the straddle. So we're going to see another multi-way, multi-bet pot, me being the three-better with ace, five of hearts. So the pot is just over a 1,000. Oh, and by the way, the under the gun, the original guy who opened, this Asian guy, Felix, he calls. His name is Felix, he calls. So we're three ways, and like a dream, the board comes out nine, deuce, three, all hearts. That's right, nine, deuce, three, all hearts. I flop the stone cold nuts. I have the nut flush with a straight flush draw. So... Joe checks in the straddle, and now this guy Felix, who was the original opener who defended to my three bet, he overcalled, he leads for 2,000. And I'm like, what the fuck is this, right? <laughs> now, I know, and somebody actually had said this on Discord, where they were like, well, Bart, I'm surprised you didn't play the nut flush fast. I thought that you sort of preached this. And I said, you would be shocked how often playing the nut flush fast is actually playing it more deceptive than you think. Because if you play the nut flush fast, you are more likely to get action from inferior hands on the flop 
than you are on later streets. And I'm not just I'm not just talking about action killing cards, which is actually going to come into play. I'm just talking about the fact that like someone with a small flush or somebody with a set, if you raise them on the turn or you wait to the river, they're just going to call. Like that's the worst. Like when somebody leads into you and you call with the nut flush and then you call turn and then you make a raise on the river and then they just call and you get no bets in whatsoever. And the more cards that come out, the more sort of things that, that beat them. But this is a little bit of a different situation, man. This is a three bet pot. And I was just like, wow, what am I ever, ever raising with here? Because even if I, I mean, I suppose, I think the hand that I, pro I might raise with actually the most here that I would be very, very comfortable raising with here on a monotone board, even in a three bet pot. There's one specific hand that I'm thinking about that I would actually think that I'm very comfortable raising where I might always raise. And that's actually the flopped king high flush. Now, what's the difference between the flopped king high flush in this situation versus the ace high flush versus the queen high flush? I never believe that someone's gonna lead into me with the nut flush in a three bet pot in this scenario. So if I have the king high flush, that's like the nuts to me. And when I start to think about the hands that they might leading with here, which might be smaller flushes, sets, or just the ace of hearts, I want to get value. Now, when I have the ace of hearts, he doesn't have that, right? And then with the queen high flush, I might actually want to play stack protection if we were deep or some sort of smaller flush. So that's why I could see primarily raising actually here with the king high flush the most. But here, I was just like, what is this guy like leading with? I mean, I suppose he could have like an overpair with hearts, and I guess he could have some sets. But when you flop a flush, I mean, there were only seven heart combo. Excuse me, there's eight, right? Yeah, there are eight hearts that can come, right, with two in our hand. I mean, that's not many, right? Just off of one card. I mean, it's like one chance and five and a half, less than 20%. Now, of course, you get board pairs. I mean, we've got nine board pairs that could come. And then, you know, the, the eight hearts, and then you're, you're starting to talk about like almost, you know, an over one third of the deck. And that's just off of one card. The chances that another heart will come or the board will pair by the river here is probably like 65, 70%. This is where the whole thing came in with the, uh, the Brandon Steven Antonio hand that I talked about at the lead of the show, where it was just insane to me that Brandon Steven didn't raise the turn on a double flush draw board when he had the nut straight with ace queen. The turn's a nine. They both have straights and Brandon with the nuts. Oh, what a turn. What a turn. Can you believe this? 13,000. 13, Will Brandon start putting some money in here? Just a call again. Well, can we see? I mean, there are a lot of action card killers. Do we see a blank here? Ooh, the river's a seven of clubs, so backdoor clubs come in. If that was an offsuit seven. And now, is Brandon just gonna call? Let's see. Oh, he just calls. Snaps. Wow, we could have seen huge. Ugh. But anyways, I was just like, what is this guy? You know, I was kind of shocked and I was like, all right, I'm just going to call. I mean, I suppose I could have raised too, but I call. I'll take the gamble, right? I call. By the way, there's also another guy in the hand here. There's another guy in the hand and who knows? I mean, it's kind of, it is one of those things though when I've got the ace of hearts in my hand, but who knows? Like, you know, once in a while he could have something where he might quote unquote make a move or, you know, if we were to raise, he might fold out something that he would overcall with. So... I call. The guy leads for 2,000 and I call. So now the pot is 7,000. The other guy gets out of the way. He thinks about it for a while and he gets out of the way. Okay. Turn is the five of diamonds. So it's nine, deuce, three, all hearts. Turns the five of diamonds. I have ace, five of hearts. The pot is 7,000 and I've got 21,000 left. So I've got about three pot size bets left, right? Now, a lot of times in these situations, like you'll get a check in a spot like this, and then I'm gonna just start piling. Like if he checked, I'm gonna bet, be betting at least 5,000. If I went five and he called, the pot would be like 17, I'd have 16 left. I might even go six. Six to seven to try to get the money in, you know, something like that. But that does not happen. He leads again, and quite large. So he bet 2,000 on the flop, I called, and now on the turn he bets 6,000. 
6,000. And I'm doing the math here a little bit in my head. I'm like, holy shit. Like, how much do I have left here? I've got 21,000 left. When I call this, if I were to just call the six, the pot would be 19 and I'd have 15 left. Now, I can easily get the money in right on the river. But the thing here though, too, like I said, going back to that other hand is, is that we've got another card that's come out. So we've got three cards for each board pair, three, six, nine, 12. And then we've got another eight heart outs because we've, you know, five are accounted for, three on the board and two in our hand. So there are 20 cards to sort of dodge here in, in the terms of like a, a board pair or another heart coming. 20 cards. Add to that too, there are some one-liners here too that might come in. It's nine, deuce, three, five. So like a four or an ace, like the guy had a set or something like that. There might even be more scare cards that he might be scared of. And when he takes this sizing now on the turn, he's not bluffing with the ace of hearts. I have the ace of hearts. It's not like I've got like, now I said that like maybe the hand that I would be raising the flop with the most might be the flop king high flush. I think honestly, at this point, if I didn't raise the king high flush here on the flop, I might actually call with it now. Now, why would that be? Why do you think that if I just flatted with the king high flush on the flop, why would I flat here on the turn, but I'm talking about raising with the nuts here? And it doesn't have to do with stack protection. And the reason, of course, if you can figure it out, is because if I flop the king high flush, it's possible that the other guy might have just the ace of hearts and he might bluff off at the end. He could be bluffing with the ace of hearts and he might bluff off, the, off at the end. Whereas here, I have the ace of hearts. So when I block the nut flush draw, his hand is more weighted towards value as opposed to if I had the king high flush where he could have the stiff ace of hearts. So at this point, I'm like, man, the pot's gonna be huge. The pot's 19, I've got 15 left. This guy really seems like he is going to, he's gonna go with whatever he has here. Like he's got a real hand. And if I shove, the pot's gonna be like 34 and it's gonna be 15 for him to call. He's gonna be getting over two to one. So I didn't really see the need to like screw around here. And now people were thinking, I read in like the YouTube comments, they're like, oh, Bart put on an act. He put on an act. I was actually really thinking about what to do. I took about... 30 seconds with it, I looked back at the board. The other thing that I thought that was interesting here too was because it's nine deuce three five, if for some reason I had like the stiff ace of hearts, like ace king with the ace of hearts, it's a wheel draw too. Somebody might convince themselves like I'm doing this like a combo draw, like with a wheel draw too. So I was like, fuck this. Like I just don't see, the, see this guy's gonna be folding here for less than a pot size bet. So I jammed it all in. So I moved all in. And after the all-in, the pot was 34, six, and it was about 15,000 for the guy to call. And he didn't snap call, but again, I felt comfortable with the all-in because I had the ace of hearts, which I felt like kind of blocked his sort of primary bluff that might be going like bet, bet, fold. So he didn't think, I mean, he thought about it for a little bit of time, asked for a count, and then he finally called. So he, he finally makes the call. And when he does that and he takes that much time, I actually really thought that there was a very, very good chance that I just had him drawing dead. Like if he had an overpair with a heart, he's drawing dead, <laughs> right? Um, if he doesn't have a set here or some sort of weird ass two pair, he's drawing dead. It's, I don't think, I don't know what two pair is going to be represented on 90s three. He's just drawing dead, right? So he thinks about it for a while and he calls and he's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to run it once, twice? And this is where this whole thing comes in. Remember now, I'm in for 35,000. So I'm in for 35,000. So if somehow I were to lose this, now there really was only an hour left in the show. So I had another 25, but you can start to see like if a pot goes down like this early on, why I would want to run it multiple times because if I run out of money inside the session, I can't play anymore in that session. It's like the one rare time. So I'm like, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. He asked me and uh, he's like, okay, twice, right? So I'm like, okay, the pot's $50,000. So I'm like, all right, I'll run it twice. The river comes a three. So the board pairs and the guy rolls over deuce three of diamonds, deuce three of diamonds. So he fills up with two pair. And I'm like, oh my God, the river on the other one was a five. It paired the board twice. <laughs> Can you imagine if the guy had like a set of threes there and I would have lost both? 
oh my God. So we end up chopping the pot. Now, just a couple of things to note here, here too. What I find interesting, now they have the percentages 93 to 7 because sometimes it takes into account some of the um, some of the dead cards. So I don't know if like a deuce or a three was dead in, in somebody's hand. But we talk about the butterfly effect sometimes in poker. It's, again, the the people were like, oh, you made a really good decision to like, the, people actually said this to me. You made a really good decision to like move all in on the turn because then you got the opportunity to run it more than once. I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> whatever. While that is true, that did not come into my thought process at all. But what I do find interesting here though is that if we did not get it in on the turn, by the way, I'm actually looking back I paused the podcast to look back. There was one deuce dead. <laughs> it was a deuce dead. I'm looking at this. His buddy had Jack Deuce of Clubs from, from plus one. So he had three outs. <laughs> he had three outs. Three outs. And that's why it was. It was pr- so it's probably more like I was more like 94% three outs. But let's say that I just played a call across the flop and also on the uh, on the turn. Interesting river. So the river obviously would have paired him up, and I would have lost, right? Now the question is, because I had this discussion with a buddy of mine actually today, and I was telling him about this. He plays a little bit of poker. I mean, recreational player. And he was watching it, and he was like, and I, and I said, well, he's like, oh man, you're lucky that you like ran, you know, ran on the turn. And I was like, well, I gotta be honest with you. If I played the turn as a call, the pot would be 19,000, right? And I have 15,000 left. And then the river would have come out the first one was a black three. So, I, you know, it would have been like 19, 15 to call. Now, let's say the guy bets like 7,000 at the end into like 19. First of all, if he shoves, um, obviously I'm going to call. But let's say he bets like 7,000. You know, talking about reverse pot odds. So he bets like 7,000 into, into 19. At that point, if I call the pot's 33, I only have another 8,000 left. So if I jam, the pot's 41 and it's 8,000 for him to call. And because it's a three at the end, I'm only really, I mean, I guess he could have deuce, deuce or nine, nine, but man, it, I never would have thought that he had two pair. Again, if the, the board is nine, deuce, three, five, three, and the dude let out at me in this three bet pot and he overcalled preflop. So it's like, there's one combo of pocket threes. There's one, there's three combos of deuces, right? So that's five, excuse me, four, three combos of nine, nine, that's seven. Seven boats or quads that I would be logically scared of. I have ace five of hearts. And then how many flushes? King jack, king queen, that's two. King 10, that's three. Queen jack, that's four. Queen 10, jack 10, that's like six small flushes. Man, it's really, really close. Like when I can give my opponent reverse pot odds, and again, you can search the site for reverse pot odds. You know what I'm talking about, which is basically like you're so short that your jam is just so little the guy is going to call with a wider range which really would have been the case here getting he would have been getting five to one i think i would have jammed at the end i mean when there is not a credible boat that's two pair i think i really would have jammed at the end so the pot would have been 19 i had 15 left if he jams i call on the offsuit three if he goes like 10 into 19 i think i jam how can i not jam the last five thousand? 10 into 19, the pot's going to be like 44 or 5 for him to call. So either way, but if I hadn't jammed on the turn, I would have lost it all. <laughs> Doesn't matter, not to be results-oriented too. I mean, the guy hit a three-outer at the end. I mean, you shake it off. I, I mean, there was only an hour left in the session, and I just take that in stride, right? Like, you know, if there wasn't luck in poker, we wouldn't have this game. 